Hello, I'm Chris Athanas. I'm a KMP developer, and this is my way. Uh, I'm a KMP developer, and today we're going to continue our series uh, on how to program from the ground up. And we are going to be getting into the last of the uh, Boop stuff, Bugoyinko, or back to object oriented programming. Oh, yeah. So, tech support. They actually came out, they got the firmware update, everything like that. And then they didn't charge the battery on the tool. So they have to come out and reschedule the guy because they already rescheduled twice. And then the new, the new company says they have to do a, a review of the, of the order because it's been rescheduled twice. It's their new policy. So hopefully we'll get this thing uh, closed up soon enough. Uh, anyway. All right. So we're down here in the class of programming and we're almost at the end. Uh, this is like the last part of it. And we're going to be talking about the pain of OOP with our, um, with our, with our, with our best professor, Igor, Igor Bugayenko. Oh, did you say Bugayenko? Yeah, Bugayenko. Okay, professor, guys, quit, quit screwing around. The professor's here. Let's listen. Let's quit, quit goofing off back there, guys. We have lecture number five in the course of, um, uh, the challenges and the problems of object-oriented programming. Actually, the course was named originally the pain of object-oriented programming. We discussed things which, uh, which are, which are, in my opinion, they may cause pain and may cause discomfort when you write object-oriented programs. And these things, I list them one by one in the lectures uh, and try to explain why they cause the pain and how do you deal with the pain. So we discussed in the first lecture, we discussed the algorithms. We discussed why uh, the algorithmic and procedural approach uh, attitude to the programs we write in object-oriented languages actually hurts us, actually makes us Right, cool. Just the procedural stuff, the algorithms, whatever, but there's just the procedural style of very imperative. Yeah, that's going to cause problems eventually. Less uh, effectively, less efficiently than we could do it. Then on the second lecture, we discussed static methods and static attributes. So I try to explain you that when you make a method static or an attribute static, you are uh, introducing troubles into your program. Then the lecture number three was about getter. So we discussed why taking the data from objects is a bad idea. So the data must be encapsulated and maybe you remember the behavior must be exposed. We encapsulate state, we hide state and we expose uh, the behavior. In lecture number four, we discussed setters and mutability. So I, uh, I told you that uh, when the, an object is mutable, then uh, this object is uh, difficult to maintain. The object is becoming larger inevitably. And um, a lot of other things uh, related to threat uh, unsafety also will happen. So it's just two things with race conditions, which is the next, the next, the next thing we're going to get into is parallel processing. We're going to get into these race conditions that can happen. We have big, big objects and they're all being muted, mutative as opposed to copy. So we're going to talk, we're going to get into that. There. And now the lecture number five, we're going to discuss objects which are named with the ER in the end. So the ER is maybe you've heard about these objects which are titled like controller or the object which is called a manager or the object which is called a reader. For example, you say stream reader. So that's the name of, of a class, not an object. Let's, name, let's say it's the name of a class. So these suffixes, the ER, the ER, the ER is what is wrong. This is what uh, is an indicator of a bad design. And it's not my idea. So uh, I will tell you that, uh, that it is a bad idea, but it's not my idea. I just, uh, I just took it from, the, um, from other people who thought the same, and I only tried to extend this idea and, and uh, illustrate it with more examples. So this he's, a, he's done a better job, honestly. And he's, the, he's like the only guy out here to actually do it. The other guys are too old. <laughs> they give it up. <laughs> so it's just me and Yegor. <laughs> well, not. Nah, he's got lots of people that are in that thing. But I'm trying to do is not as pure as approach as him, but take his ideas. A lot of them are just awesome. It's the same ones that Alan was talking about. It's just he's just he, he's talking about it with the modern the modern language ter terminology, and Alan's still back in the '90s. And a lot of these older guys are just they, they've kind of done with it. They're moving on to other things like playing with their young grandkids. <laughs> structure of the lecture. First of all, I'm going to show you the examples and alternatives, how to get rid of this ER suffixed objects. Then we're going to discuss the client suffix, which in my opinion is kind of a brother of the uh, of this ER suffix. It also is a, is a trouble. Then we will discuss what to do with the performance because many people, when I tell them that ER objects are bad, they, the, the, the question number one they ask is what to do with the performance. Always, always, always with the performance, right? These guys cannot quit with the performance. And well, and it's because they, we are still coming back from this time where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's okay. We're going to get into this parallel processing section, right? So we're coming from this time when this stuff down here, this, these function calls at this level of time, which is, this is how much light travels in, uh, the, and these, uh, these time scales. So this is about the light length of your laptop. A photon will, uh, travel this fast at this, in this time frame. So it's really hard to figure out what these time frames mean. 
And at these time frames up here, it's going, you know, going across the city. So, so it's a logarithmic, uh, it's a logarithmic time frame. So, they, so these guys were really, really concerned about. Uh, they, here we have. Uh, where's the? Where, where is it? Where is it? Uh, function calls, a uh, virtual function calls. Like the difference between these two things actually made a big difference. And if you're chunking through massive amounts of data, those guys are always trying to find ways of eking it down just a little bit more because they can, you know, pink pink zone, optimize their thing better. So they're always piping up first, and they're like, guys, you're missing the point. That's not where the problems are at. I know you guys have your problems. C++, I got it, I got it. But there's this other thing that's going on that we're not, you know, we're the people a little bit quieter about, like how do we structure these things so they don't fall over when we, when we want to go change something. Then a few words about model view controller, because as you can see, of course, model view controller is the design pattern which is heavily based on an object called controller, which is, we claim now today that is a bad, is a bad design. But this model view controller, the MVC is, the very popular pattern in web development and uh, uh, and uh, UI applications like desktop, desktop. It's Android. Android is this stuff. And I also just want to say, well, I'm not going to watch this whole thing, but you definitely should. Applications, for example, or mobile applications. This MVC is a, is a central piece of um, these kinds of applications. And I claim that MVC is a bad design pattern, and I'll explain you why. And then I'll show you the example. The, the practical software. I'll show you two frameworks, like actually one application, one frame. So modern Android is moving away from this MVC. They have this whole. Composed UI pattern is just so much nicer to deal with. In so many ways, it's been well more thought out than the MVC style, which we, I understand at the time we needed to get it done. We needed to get it done. And we need to be efficient about it because these are machines weren't that fast. But that's not the case anymore, okay? We can we'll go up one level now. We Please, can we? Please? I mean, people listen to this can understand what I'm talking about. Let the enterprise people still duke it out with a C++. We just take this just a little bit more performance. Let, let those guys duke it out. Well, there's other areas now that are opened up because uh, the AI tools and this under, understanding how to structure your applications so that can be changed easily by not just you, but other people. This is the way. This is, like, this is the goal. This is, we're going to have to figure it out. And this thing, like this is a very clean way to do it. And this guy... You know, he's, this is why we're talking about it. Let's keep going. Where we get rid of ER objects and design everything without these objects. And it's a web, real web application, which is, you know, which is working, which is, uh, which is uh, used by people for more than 10 years, and it's quite stable, and it doesn't have a single ER and it's ER suffixed object. So let's start. Let's start with a quote to prove you that I'm not the, the one who invented this. So I found this quote, which in my opinion was the first, so maybe there were other people saying the same, but I found this one. Uh, being the Alan Kay was saying this from the beginning, so let's keep going. The, the first, the, the, the earliest. And this guy, Carla, is saying that when you need a manager, the manager, pay attention to the R suffix, the manager, uh, it's often a sign that the managed, this manager is managed some managing somebody. So the managed are just plain old data structures. Remember, plain old data structures. Remember? Right. Well, they still call them objects because they're in a class. Oh, it's, a, it's a class object. We're doing object right No. No, that's just destruct. There's no methods in there. And these managers have no data and you're just modifying a struct that's not object oriented that's the cop stuff that's that class oriented stuff that's that pseudo oop stuff you're trying to do procedural i know it's hard to uh, you don't just i want the speed i, I gotta I change my brain and i have to change the whole program yeah you might have to do that remember we talked about that that we don't want objects to be plain old data structures. We don't want them to be just plain old data structures. We want them to be behavioral objects, not anemic. So he's saying exactly about that. Are just anemic, anemic. Plain old data structures, and that the manager is the smart procedure, pay attention, procedure, doing the real work. So in this quote, An anemic, if you didn't see the last episode, just means a plain old data structure. The no, there's no uh, methods that change the data. It's just a data structure, no functions. That's anemic. And they keep on adding these damn words. I got to put that in here, probably. So we put Carlo put together everything I'm, I'm going to tell you today. So we don't want somebody, some object, to be a, a smart procedure who is managing plain old data structures. We want this procedural. We want objects to be smart. We want objects to manage themselves, not some smart procedure staying outside of an object and managing the object. Let's start with an example, chapter number one. Parser, a super classic example in my opinion. So the parser is on the left. This is all Java. And he does, does a good job explaining. Like, shut up. Just start, listen to the professor. You see the, so first look at this part. Don't look at the right one. Look at the left one. So it's a parser. The parser has two, well, it's, it's extremely, it's extremely a special case. So the parser is not even a parser, but I would say it's a parsing utils. 
as you know. So that's probably the, 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 uh, the right name for, for this class would be parse utils. So it has a parse integer and parse float, or maybe if you remove the, if you remove the, static, the static modifier here, then it's gonna be a real par parser, how people usually design it. So there are two parsing, the two methods which are supposed to parse. You put the string as an input, and then it returns you either as an integer or a float, you know, depending on, on the method. It's pretty clear how to use it. You say parser dot, well actually it's not right, you say in this case parser dot, but we can also imagine this, new parser, and then dot parse. Right, so it's creating an object just to call, just to, just to have it a bag, of, a bag of utilities, just to call the functions on it. Oh, okay, that's just function, that's just straight up procedural. And so he's using this pseudocode here saying, imagine if you will, some function here that took this string and somehow parsed it and returned this integer. That's what he's saying here. Imagine there's a thing that parsed this string T and returned it as a float. So this is some sort of number parser. Okay. Oh, don't search. Int and whatever. So you create a parser and then you call this parser, please parse me the integer and return me the, 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 the result. I'm sure you've seen the code like this many times. That's how Maybe you haven't, but this is extremely common. And they, it looks, it looks like it's object. You're using classes, you're creating new, you're dot things on it. But this is all just straight up procedural. How people design parsing algorithms when something is coming in and something has to go out. So we say, okay, if this is happening, then of course we need a procedure. Remember, smart procedure, which is taking an input, which doesn't understand what's happening to it. It's a plain old data structure. So the, the string has no idea what's inside. The string doesn't know that it actually contains the number, that it actually contains a string representation of a float. It's a completely dumb, anemic piece of data. And this piece of data is coming in. We are smart. The parser is smart. The parser takes the pieces out. De somehow decompose it into you know more semantically meaningful uh, elements and then returns back You're saying this function does it float. so the smart procedure is the parser the plain data coming in and some other plain data is coming out it's just, it's just procedural it's not good it's not good because for many reasons because the data doesn't know what it is the data still remains completely unaware of what it contains so what he's trying to say is this thing will take any string you could throw anything in there there's no you're not having it tied saying, hey, this is this is actually going to be a float. Repre this this data structure is going to represent our float. So it's a, now it's just a string. You don't know what it is. So the smart, That's what the, the logic, the, the, um, the algorithmic part. Of our and, you know, I do appreciate Professor Igor because he does. This English is not his first language. It's his second one or maybe third. And uh, his vocabulary is pretty amazing, but it's like sixth or seventh grade level. So it's really... Um, he tries to simplify things, and sometimes it gets a little too simple. So I'm trying to fill in the gap, that gaps here. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Our program is inside the parser, outside of the object, which actually must uh, contain that uh, must contain that, that information. A better alternative is on the right side of the screen. So look at this. So instead of making some parser, we make our data smarter. We encapsulate the data inside the object, which is now be, which behaves now, which has additional behavior additional to what the data had before. So the data is a string. The data didn't know that apparently there's an integer inside. And then we put this data into a larger object and, and this larger object knows that the, the, the data inside is actually a string. And then we come to this object and say, give me your integer value. So turn Right, so that's this little thing he's implementing here, this, this interface number. So all that interface number says, hey, is, if you're gonna place into your number, is interface, if you're gonna implement this interface number, you have to have this thing called int value that's gonna give me an int. That's all that is right there. Turn yourself into an integer, and it returns the integer. Start it may give me your integer value. So turn yourself into an integer, and it returns the integer. It makes the processing. It parses the data and returns the integer uh, back. And look how we use it. We have the same data here as here. You see 42, the same there. So we encapsulate it into a new object, which has the behavior which we're looking for, and then we pass this object to where we need it to be. And then when it's necessary, somebody else will call, give me the integer value from this object, and the integer value will be returned. Yes, at some later time, when it's not necessary, that says it lazily. It's like, oh, I'm not, okay, I got the data, but I don't, nobody asked for it. I'm not doing any calculations. And that's where it's like lazily, eva lazily evaluated. Like, so when you actually call it, that's when, the, that's when the calculation will happen, when it actually does the parsing. That's the, the idea. So we, are, we have a lot of advantages on the right script, on the right snippet, comparing to the left one. I can, I can name them. First, for example, we, uh, in this case, if you look at the right snippet, then this n, this variable n, well, it's an object, so this object uh, is lazy. So the evaluation of the actual uh, integer, so the parsing mechanism, the algorithm, will be executed only when it's necessary. So let's say if between these two lines, we're gonna have another, I don't know, 50 lines of code, and then maybe some of them will do the, the return. We discussed that before, remember, on the, 
uh, we discussed the, the temporal coupling. So now these, these two things, they, are, they can be completely detached from each other. And, and, and this evaluation is lazy. So when, when and if this method will be called, only then the parsing will happen. So this code on the right is more declarative, much more declarative, while the code on the left is, is so-called imperative. So the imperative code is when we tell the computer to do exactly what we need right here, right now. They right, so this parse int right here, as soon as you call that, it's gonna go up here and actually do the parsing. So even though you may not need this X at this particular moment, maybe you need it later, like this N, you don't might, you know, it's not evaluating right here, it's just creating it. You, just, you're not allowed to do that here. You have to, it does it right then, boom. So you may not need it then. You may want to need it later for some other thing, some other thing, but you just want to have the object around just in case. We do, we are going to do the calculation, but when the calculation happens, then we do it. Then we actually do the, do the, the, the process thing. So that's a pretty good advantage. Clarity approach is when we declare the intent, which is say, we want this to be a parsed string. So we want N to behave like a number which is taken from that string. And it will behave like this, like a number. How exactly it will happen inside? We don't care much. I'll show you now one example, which, is, uh, which will illustrate it even more. But now just compare two pieces. You now see the difference, the parser and an object with the parsing behavior. Instead of making a parser, a manager who deals with data, we just extend the data with more behavior. It was not enough for us, the behavior we had. We had just a string, but that's not enough because the string has something inside which is, which is more than just a collection of, of characters. We want this collection of characters to become, you know, to become a number. So we, we extend the object by decorating or by, by, by composition. It's called extension by composition. So we make a composition of, of two objects. So actually, this is an object. This is the object we had, the string, and this is the object we created. So we had one object and we decorated it with a larger one. Then we have two, but we have a larger object. Another example, reader. All right, okay. So let me go back here for a second. So this is like, it's, this is the mind flip that's, that's, that's difficult for a lot of people, right? This feels, this looks like, like, like object oriented, but it's actually not. You're still just doing the straight up imperative style, line by line by line by line by line. Very convenient, very, very much the way C++ is kind of set up for this. This is uh, the OOP style. This is the, back, the original LNK OOP style where you're declaring, you're declaring, hey, I have a string here as an integer. And there's the string. The string is 42. It's not number 42. It's a string 42. Now we can imagine this could be like um, order, uh, uh, sorry, order, uh, order as string or, or st string as order. And it would be like a big long string, like a JSON string or some string of characters that says, I have an order from here to there, you know, maybe in English, whatever. And then to actually parse it, you do the, you know, n dot parse value. And then it would have to go, you know, maybe send it up to Google and it does this translation and it tries to figure out what you were trying to say. And, and it gives you three choices out of the things, or that, that kind of stuff. We don't actually want to do it then. We just say, hey, we have this thing. And then, and when we actually go down here, when the, that's when we actually evaluate. So that's, that's the idea. So we had one object and we decorated with a larger one. Then we have two, but well, we have a larger object. Another example, reader. Again, look at the text on the left. The reader is, uh, again, it's a static. It's, 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 I'm using static here, so maybe it's not really a, a canonical. So input stream is just a file. That's all it is. So you're just trying to put in a file. And they say it's coming in like a stream, like a stream of water, a stream of characters. That's how they see it. It's like one character coming in at a time, as opposed to all of a sudden as a chunk. You can actually read a little piece at a time. So that's why I call it a stream. And I call it an input stream. And you can read one, so you can read one character at a time, you can read 10 at a time. So you can just bring it in as if it's a stream of water coming in and you're filling up a bucket, as opposed to just dumping it in the bucket and you're saying, here's the bucket. That's the big idea. That's the metaphor. And you'd be surprised how many people don't understand what that is. The way of doing this. So here I would say instead of reader dot, I would say new reader and then read character. Read character. So, but whatever, either you do it this way or either you do that way, static or not static, it doesn't make a big difference because this reader class and usually all these ER classes, they are dateless. So they have no data inside. They only have a collection of procedures. So they the job is full of this kind of stuff, right? So that's why it's not really an object oriented language. It's gonna be, if it was, it would be like this over here. Not like this, it'd be like this. There we go. 
they rarely encapsulate some valuable data. Usually they just provide uh, functionality. They just expose the behavior encapsulating zero data. So, and that's why, and, and because of this, we can turn them into, into collections of static methods. So look at this. We, we ask this reader to take the input stream as an, as an argument and then read the input stream, take the next character and return this character to us. So how we use it, we say, we make the, the input stream there and then we say read one character and the character is returned. So again, the input stream is something which n has no behavior which we're looking for. So we had an input stream, but the input stream doesn't have the behavior which we're looking for. We need the stream to be read, and if the stream is finished, then we need to return null. And you gotta know that a file input stream, you have to use a reader. You gotta know all these things are related. <laughs> it's, 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 it's exposing all these details that it would be nice just to, to, to extract some of this stuff away as opposed to knowing all the details. Now, if you need to know the details, yes, it's important. But like, it's too much. So Kotlin takes a different approach and, uh, uh, on the library. It's really nice. And we'll, maybe I'll we'll have an example in the future, but uh, it's actually way better. Yeah. It's not a good idea. We'll discuss now in the next lectures. But let's say for it's now, for the sake of this uh, conversation, let's say we want, this to, 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 we want the functionality which is written there. To read the character, if the stream is empty, then return null. And input stream doesn't have this, this behavior for us. So what do we do? Instead of making an external uh, reader, instead of making a reader which is smart enough to do that with our input stream, which, is, which remains clueless of what's going on. So input stream has no clue how it's being used. Instead, we create a new object. Now I'm looking here on the right snippet, which encapsulates the input stream. And I think this is Ruby I, I, or Python. I can't tell. And then, and then introduces two new features, two new behavioral uh, features. I think that's the right word. So now the behavior of this, of this so I guess these are functions he's defining here. Function next returns a character. Function exists returns a boolean. I would say is exists, but keep going. Object, the, the, I, I call them characters or characters. So it has the, the method next, and we can use the method exists as well. So now the input stream became larger. There exists another character ready, if there's another character available. All right, and end of the file, EOF is end of file, or is there another character available? Sure. That's awesome. We extended the input stream, made its functionality bigger, and everywhere we go with this input stream, ideally, then who interact with us can enjoy this new functionality. So nobody needs to know about some reader classes. Nobody needs to know about some parser classes. They just deal with me. I was a string, now I'm a string with extra functionality. So right here, like here where you're opening this file here, you just open this file here. And then later on, and then later on you can say, you can just define these characters right next to each other like that. And somewhere later down the stream, you just say, give me the next character, give me the next character. It doesn't know about the file input stream or readers or anything. Just give me the next characters. The characters are coming from this characters thing that is, that is based on this file input stream. Somewhere defined, so declared it. And just give me the next one. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't need a robot, no reader. That's the idea there. So I want you to listen to the rest of his stuff on your own time. And we're going to talk about, let's do the next one. Let's do the next one down here. Uh, so Professor Boogie is awesome. Uh, a system is not a tree. Yes, a system is not a tree. So this is a very common thing that uh, computer people, because there's so many dang trees everywhere, uh, we start thinking everything's a tree. And it's not quite. That's, it does at the first, it seems that way, but eventually we're going to start to get more network offense effects coming in. And we just have to know this as a part of the system and a part of the design. Here we go. God dang, why is that not a story? So I'm going to quote from uh, Fred Brooks, uh, Mythical Man Month, where he makes a, a particular observation about how we spend our time. Um, the first observation he makes, he goes back to, our, goes back to Aristotle, let's examine software's difficulties. Following Aristotle, I divide them into essence, the difficulties inherent in the nature of software. To be precise, the difficulties inherent in the nature of the domain that you are trying to work in. And accidents, those difficulties that today attend its production, but that are not inherent. In other words, the things that are not intrinsically a part of the software development that you're doing, that are not intrinsically to do with whatever domain that you're working in. And then the question, to which I think we probably know the answer, unfortunately. How much of what software engineers now do is still devoted to the accidental as opposed to the to Put some design patterns in it. I heard about that conference last week, these design patterns. I got them from this book that I got from the conference. Yeah, we need to put some more design patterns in there. <laughs> the essential. How much is to do with byproducts of just the way we have designed something, just because we've chosen something in a particular way. I was doing a consultancy uh, visit last week to a company, and I saw a couple of their, uh, let me see, three, three, four of their projects. Um, and I've been doing stuff for these guys for a number of years. Um, so there's a lot of continuity there. And one particular group, um, it's, not that, it's not that I kind of hit my head against the wall every time I see them, or you know, burst out into uncontrollable tears or anything like that, or run fleeing from the building. But it is one of those things that a few years ago, I gave them a, two recommendations for how they should consider their architecture. 
And, um, and I said, the first one, you've got 12 months, you said, to develop this. If you take the first recommendation, it's, it's kind of like a sort of a dungeon game, isn't it? If you take the first door, it will take you three months. If you take the second door, it will take you six weeks, and then you can go on holiday for the rest of the year. But if you choose the door of darkness, as your current estimates and architecture suggest, it will take you 12 months. No, it won't. It will take you 18 months. This is where this exact uh, 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 presentation is where I got the idea of adventuring, uh, product, product management by adventuring. Expedition, expedition adventuring. <laughs> anyway, I just, just keep going. Um, they chose the third door. And so every time I go back, in fact, last week was very easy because I said, didn't I tell you guys this last year? Didn't the problem that you had last year, couldn't you have solved? And it's a little bit like that. So for that team, I can say pretty much everything they have done since 2011 has been to do with the accidents. And not all teams are as extreme as that. I saw a couple of really good teams last week. But there is this question of being able to see the structure, to see the trees of the woods, so to speak. Um, now. You know, pop reference, Michael Jackson. Okay, not that Michael Jackson, a different one. Software requirements and specifications. Now, this book is a truly brilliant book, and only a few people know this. It's 20 years old now. Um, and I haven't read it. I did The Mythical Man Month, but I haven't read this one. And it's kind of a, a best kept secret. It's really worth a read. Okay, it doesn't have the most riveting title Software requirements and specifications. It's not Oof, kind of. Terrible title, guys. Marketing department, do you guys got one? No? We need one. Of, you know, requirements distilled or something like that. There's no, nothing sexy uh, in there, or no requirements, or no specifications, or anything like that. It's got no hashtag that makes it interesting. But there's a mild suggestion in the subtitle. Didn't they learn from Bjorn Strustrup? Come on, guys. Get your sales organization in order. A lexicon of practice principles and prejudices that mm, he's kind of got some interesting things going on here. And in here, he looks alphabetically, you know, through all the way from A through to, I think he gets about as far as W or Y, a number of little items. Um, and near the beginning of the book, because it begins with A, he talks about arboricide which is not a common word. Arboricide is the murder of trees. Okay, so I'm not trying to guilt trip you here on any kind of environmental thing. More specific. The victims of arboricide are the descriptive tree structures that are so often found in software, holding together many individual elements in one coherent and immediately understandable harmony. Does anyone remember what this is? Starts with a P, ends with an edral, procedural, no, anyone, anyone? In other words, it all kind of fits together, this beautiful hierarchy. Software development should not be a trade of constructing difficulty from simplicity. If you want to take any quotes from this talk, I think that, that, that one is the one that you want to have like pinned somewhere. Quite the contrary. So where there are trees to be shown, you should show them and refrain from turning the relationships they describe into a puzzle. It is essentially a matter of a span of description. Our boreside then is using a smaller description span when a larger one would be better. In other words, size your description structures and software as a description structure. It is information. Well, this is not a tree anymore. To the things that make sense, can be understood, can be manipulated, and reflect aspects of the real world. Fine. We see that. More, uh, more briefly, Donald Knuth, trees sprout up just about everywhere in computer science. We have this idea, this familiarity, because we know that trees are a real thing. We know that trees have the roots at the top and the leaves. <laughs> These computer people. At the bottom. And all those other people out there who have this other belief about them are... I sad. think we heard this from the math people. So why do the math people grow their trees from the root down? That's weird. Be mistaken, but we humor them. And we know trees are red and black, not green. So what's one of the most common sorts of trees? Let's go back a bit. Structured programming. Um, structured programming. A number of people have an idea of what this means. We can summarize it nicely with block structure. Um, there's this idea of hierarchy of calls. Decompose a system into a recursive, well, a recursive whole, a tree. So this is kind of good. And we end up with kind of a main program and subroutine kind of approach. Okay, you have main, it calls subroutines, which call further subroutines, and so on. Now, what a lot of people don't know is actually there's a little bit more to this. There is actually an architectural model that fits with structured programming um, with its own jargon. An afferent branch, a transform branch, and an efferent branch. So <laughs> feel free to use that with your colleagues at any point. And you might be I'm not even, you can go look up what those mean. They're ridiculous. It's ridiculous. More of that terminology. I'm not even going to put that in this document. You know, hey, we don't use main and subroutines and stuff like that. We're all kind of functional now. That's okay. There you go. Functional programming. Done. Uh, structured programming and functional programming, the difference is degree of side effects. It turns out the decomposition criteria are very surprisingly similar. Um, and we have this overall structure. And this looks beautiful, and it's pretty, and it's tree-like. There's only one problem. It's not the way that we program, not even when we try to program like this. We end up with the fact that the graph is compromised. It becomes directed, a directed acyclic graph. In other words, we like relationships that fan in as well as those that fan out. We like reuse relationships. Uh, we mix levels quite naturally. In fact, sometimes we recurse levels quite naturally. We describe something in terms of itself, and this comes out as a very natural description. So it's kind of- We're talking about, we can't, we're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna start out with, the, with the, the network stuff, but eventually, eventually, when you're gonna go to a certain size, you're eventually gonna go from this pretty, pretty little thing right here, this tree, oh, it's so balanced, right, to this. So plan on this happening. 
How do we plan this happening and not losing our minds? That's or hair like Kevlin. <laughs> tree like but if you ever saw a tree like this in a forest you'd wonder what on earth had gone gone wrong you know this is a, a serious case of arboreal engineering this is no longer a tree but it is certainly very useful it's a better reflection of how we think so the tree was a kind of useful starting point but it's de it's, it's sort of fallen apart it's become deconstructed into something else now we might think well okay that's all very well this is you know i might apply this kind of reasoning to um, structured programming functional programming procedural thinking and so on but surely we should be more up to date and talk about you know some objecty stuff as well because that's where people often find trees it turns out object-oriented programming was covered in this book from the 1970s. Concept hierarchy. Hold on. Okay. Hierarchies. They didn't call it inheritance, it's called concatenation. Um, concept hierarchies, the construction principle involved is best called abstraction. We concentrate on features common to many phenomena and we abstract away features too far removed from the conceptual level at which we are working. Um, so everything. So infrastructure is supposed to mean like, uh, okay, domain. So it's like inside your app, the inner core of your app, and then use the services that interlock and talk to your databases and your network and any devices you have on the line, like printers, whatever, that's the infrastructure. So this is like the interfaces to the infrastructure, right? So you're supposed to be able to swap out any of these layers. Well, not the domain, but you would swap out these things and not have to change any of the domain, which is just your, your inner app, right? And just the core of your application. You know, if it needs to go get a file, that's part of a service that then goes out to the infrastructure to get whatever it is. So that's, that's the layered approach. The thing that you need to know was invented in the 1960s and 1970s, including disco, unfortunately, but there we go. So there's, there's, a, there's a different tree. And this is very similar to one that I've come across in a, in a couple of companies, but there's one specific uh, incident I'm thinking of where a company created, and they had a team that had created um, a, an architecture for uh, middleware that was based very much uh, on these lines. They created an infrastructure level, very much a kind of toolkit of classes, uh, base classes there, and they derived from those a set of service-related classes that would build on this idea of toolkits. This is a very common idea um, uh, of uh, having the root of the hierarchy gift all of these wonderful services, and you accumulate these by concatenation as you go down. And finally, you hit your domain model, and uh, your application programmers busily hack out this. So the top two levels were communicated and, um, and uh, developed by a core infrastructure uh, team, and then the application developers worked in the domain. Uh, the problem is that this was absolutely a nightmare to develop against. Uh, the dependencies were huge. You looked at the service layer, you looked at the infrastructure layer, and they brought in dependencies from way, way over there and way over there in order to try and test the domain classes. A ridiculous amount of work has to be put in. And any kind of change was a ridiculous amount of change. It kind of let off a kind of tsunami of uh, a ripple effect every time you tried to change anything. It re actively resisted the one thing that we know is true in software development, that change is the only constant. So it got to so the point. I made myself desperately unpopular. So uh, it got to the point where the where the the doghouse was the, the the roof was starting to buckle because they went too far out, and any more expanded is just going to make the roof collapse even more. That's that's where you get. Um, I was actually supposed to be there reviewing their test cases, and it turns out that none of the application developers could successfully develop any tests against um, this. Remember the first first moment I sat down next to a test is just a, just a piece of code that like is automatically instead of calling it inside the application while it's running you're calling little pieces of code and and change make does it, does it still do this thing does it still does it do that way and you can only I mean with a system that's all fragile and can be completely all interlinked testing it becomes a real problem to one guy and we're looking at this test case and it's just one of those things you kind of, you kind of ask you say just out of interest the um, the color the color of the code yes that's exactly the same color as the color of comments. Yes, it is. Is that because it's a comment? Yes, it is. I had to comment all the tests out. So we're looking at a big comment that runs. Well, he doesn't, we never execute it because it's a comment. Well, yeah, that stands to reason. So why is it commented out? Because we can't get the test to work. Oh, okay. Well, perhaps we shouldn't just review a comment. And this is pretty- Oh, oh you think that's rare? Oh, you, th you think this is, this is what he's talking about is rare? I mean, I've worked at a lot of companies that just never did, just never got around to the chess thing. And it showed. And that's why the people left, because it became too hard to get anything done. Because it was the way it was built. No planning, no documentation, no, no what we were trying to do, and, you know, nothing. Just, there's the code, good luck. Pretty much repeated in various forms around the other developers. So uh, kind of spending a bit of time with them, worked out that what they really wanted was something like this. And here we make an additional separation. So what you see here is rather than one big tree structure, we see multiple small tree structures that are bound together. But what we've done is we further separate a concept from realization rather than using inheritance as a subclassing mechanism. We it's about to show it, don't worry. Use as a classification mechanism, the original concept uh, uh, approach, and then plugged in various pieces. Um, we still have 
the cross-cutting view of domain services and infrastructure, but now what we see is that our model is, well, we no longer have a tree, we have multiple trees that are linked together, I guess you could call it a forest or a copse or something like that, and then our classification model cuts right across itself. We have So the guy on the slides is, is falling over, I guess he goes on a coffee break or something. Organization, domain services and infrastructure. It's no longer tidy and nested and tree-like, but it turns out to be surprisingly useful. So, if anybody's wondering, one of my hobbies is taking photographs of books. I've got quite good at it recently. Uh, Him and his books. This is a rather right. unusual book. Um, as you can tell from the cover, this is actually a book about postmodernism. Um, postmodernism is a fancy way of saying, ah, we couldn't be bothered. So, hey, here it is. Um, uh, that might be a gross oversimplification, but it'll do for this uh, talk. There, there are some interesting uh, things in here. The thing that I want to focus on is this collection of essays about really looking at the idea of design after a strict, tidy worldview um, that perhaps um, some aspects of modernism uh, uh, sort of pushed, but not necessarily all of them. So it caricatures modernism a little bit, just as I caricature postmodernism. Um, the essay I want to focus on is this one, The City is Not a Tree, because this is the one where this talk takes the title from. Um, a City is Not a Tree by Christopher Alexander. And if you're thinking perhaps that name just sounds a little bit familiar, um, it should do, because on the very same floor, but on a different day, I took this photograph. Um, the Times Square Building, this is one of the classic books on patterns, not patterns to do with object-oriented design or software development, but original patterns, patterns to do with building architecture. And Christopher Alexander was the originator of this. Uh, and they kind of like, the people that did the design patterns, they were okay with people being a little confused with the, this guy's patterns. Right? They, kinda, they were kind of okay with it. They let it. they let it go for a while before they said anything. And people were trying to compare the computer programming uh, patterns with this stuff, and it was bad. Um, so it's that Christopher Alexander. And again, he's concerned with large scale structure and small scale structure. And so in the city is not a tree, he makes a number of observations. Um, one of the sort of key observations, the tree in my title is not a green tree with leaves, it's the name of an abstract structure. So we're all comfortable with that, that's great. He's just speaking to building architects who think that trees are green and stuff like that. I shall contrast it with another more complex abstract structure called a semi-lattice. Both the tree and the semi-lattice are ways of thinking about how a large collection of many small systems goes to make. He's talking about the tree organizational structure, not the architectural tree. I got that confused when I first heard this. He's not about the architectural trees or uh, on the models and stuff. He's talking about the conceptual layout of a tree versus this thing he's calling a semi-lattice, which is just a network. Okay. Cover a large and complex system. So if we imagine something like this, this could be an organizational chart, an organogram. Like tree. Um, it could be a call uh, chart. It could be a number of different things, but it has this kind of common idea of a strict tree structure. Um, and it's neat and tidy, um, and certainly if it's an organizational chart, it's normally neat and tidy and represents power struggles, but it doesn't actually represent how the work is done. Right. It doesn't actually represent how the work is done. And as software developers making software, we actually have to know how the work is done. Because if our system is going to support how the work is done, it has to be done <laughs> to support the work. <laughs> this is not... No, come and clear. <laughs> Lattice is potentially a much more complex and subtle structure than a tree. Uh, than a tree. The subtlety is important, but it's complexity that people fear. In other words, normally when things are not organized and tidy, the complexity is accidental rather than essential. But to go a step further, he says actually there's something missing. If we don't appreciate the right kind of, as it were, inherent or essential complexity here, it's this lack of structural complexity, characteristic of trees, which is crippling our concepts of the city. What he was looking like, so, our, so our inherent nature is to take these object-oriented, these, these ideas, and think of everything as a damn tree. And what he's saying, and what we're saying here is that that's you're over you're you're oversimplifying now. You're oversimplifying on the the logical layout design, and you're over complicating on the code. <laughs> yeah, the best, the worst of both worlds. No wonder. Looking out was the idea that sometimes people are trying to do urban planning based on a beautiful tree model. In other words, you kind of make everything nested, and you have your kind of industrial region, semi-light industry, residential, and so on, and you zone it like that. You have very strict hierarchical structures, uh, of, uh, and you also have tree, um, a tree structure in terms of how the roads feed everything. And it's all simple. It looks brilliant on a slide. It looks brilliant when drawn out. Absolutely a hell to live in. He says, the reality today, social structures thick with overlap. The systems of friends and acquaintances form a semi-lattice, not a tree. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because when we go back to this and we appreciate how organizations... So that's a network. Calls us a semi lattice. It's not a network. It's a semi lattice. Okay, so it has a starting like it's a central point. Okay, you just that's arbitrary, right? This thing could be formed in a bunch of different ways. Now it's not just one point. This could be the one top point. This could be the top point. This could be the top point. Okay, so no, it's a semi lattice. To actually work, then they work like this. Nobody puts that on a diagram. The fact that actually. You know, my kids, my, my, my kids in the same class as the other kid from over there, and that person is further up the organizational tree, and we go to barbecues together or do something like that. The fact that I've known that person since university, or the fact is that I get on really well with that person because um, we worked on a project a while back, and although we're in different parts of the organization, we still communicate about related work, and actually that's how this project got done. 
In other words, it's the subtlety that actually gives rise to the reality. It's not done like this, it's actually done like this. Now, why does this matter? Because organizations, large and small, have an effect on their software. Um, this is not the resolution of my screen. Uh, this is uh, that's uh, causing this. This is the sheer age of the pixels we're dealing with. Okay? These pixels date back to a time, oh, way, way before, way before Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon. This was ink. This ink was laid down before even 2001 A Space Odyssey had previewed what it would be like to land on the moon. It was written in 1967, published in 1968. It was an observation about how systems and people interact. It's uh, often known, uh, this is Conway's classic paper, published in Data Nation in 1968. Uh, Melvin Conway, How Do Committees Invent? So he's basically saying the structure of your code and the way you design your program or application is going to reflect how the business or whatever the, the organization is that you're trying to help with their structure, it's going to look like that. Ooh, it's a law. Ooh. No, it's just kind of how things work. Like if, it's, if you're going to try and support a business, you're not going to make it a trucking company when they're a, 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 boarding, a boarding house for, for, for dogs. Okay, there may be something there, but they're really separate things. So this is where this domain-driven development idea is coming from as well. From which we get the idea of Conway's law. It turns out to have a really, really strong effect. The basic thesis is that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Not copies of the organizational charts, but copies of how people actually get together and right. do things. It's not even necessarily just geographical, it's lines of communication. Which there, there are many forces on this. And, you kind of and that's when you go in, they'll show you the org chart, and they're like, oh yeah. And so these guys don't even know this. The people who are running this business don't even know this. They think it's all you know, just neat and convenient. They don't, they're not mapping out the stuff of the actual processes. So this is, this is like at least 50% of the work <laughs> is discovering these things. They see these forces pushing and pulling against a code base. It also explains to us why it is that sometimes, um, this is his next observation says, we've seen that this fact has important implications for the management of system design. Design efforts should be organized according to the need for communication. But how do you, so here's a very simple question. How do you make a system big? How do you make a big system? What determines the size of a system? And lots of people would love to say, oh, the size of the system is determined by the amount of functionality that we need to have in it. That's beautiful. Pinch them, wake them up, because that's not reality. Okay. They're in a dream world. It's determined by the number of people we decided were going to be involved. Okay? It turns out that you can make a system. In fact, uh, an example of a company I uh, did some consulting for a few years ago. They were creating this kind of state machine. It's a telephony uh, system. They are creating the state machine, um, and it was beginning to look really, really complex. They were taking a very C-based approach. In fact, it was a very ugly C-based approach. You can still do procedural. more elegantly if you program C properly. Um, but they were using C++, and I said, look, here's a it's Procedural, same thing. It's all the same. It's cops. So he was starting to pick up on this, like, hey, wait a sec, what's going on here? But he didn't, he hasn't named it like I have. Like, I'm just being really harsh about which is which and why. A bunch of techniques that will simplify this. And I drew them up, and I said, look, see how simple this is? And I did a simple demo of code. I said, you yeah, know, this will scale really nicely. I, I, I was, uh, the next day, I went in, and they'd had their little scrum meeting. And I said, so how's that going? And I talked to the one guy that I thought was going to be responsible for the state machine. He says, yeah, we've got no problem with that. We think your idea is great. And the eight of us are now going to develop it. And so it's like, no, 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 this is a one or two person job. It's a one person job, or rather it's a one keyboard job. And at this point, mob programming had not been invented. Pair programming certainly had, and these teams did pair. And I just thought, well, you need one pair to sit there and code this up. You'll be done by the end of the week. Oh, no. When you've got eight people, you can take months to do this. Correct. We, this is people's jobs. This, we, if we could do is do it with two people, why do the six other people need to be there? Again, Kevin, not, no, not picking up, okay. <laughs> because this team, there are other teams, this team was the state machine team. That's what we do. So therefore, that's what we're gonna do. That's how you inflate something. Yeah, a friend of mine took a job that I turned down because I thought these guys are insane. Um, he took a job for quite, he took, he took it with full knowledge of what I told him, uh, but for him it was convenient, he could walk to work. Um, whereas that wasn't a, a consideration from my perspective. And he, I remember he, he sort of, we had a chat about this after a while, because I said, I just don't see how they could do something, why they need that many people. Uh, a couple of years on, he said, yeah, it's kind of interesting. We discovered another part of the organization in another part of the UK had developed a system that was functionally equivalent to ours. We took 100 people and, and about three years. These guys took 10 people and about 12 months. We make a system as large, not as it needs to be, but as large as we wanted to make it, because of the, the way we staff it, the way we create the communication parts. So it turns out that the structures will have a really important force on the software architecture. It turns out this is related to development process and the details within it. Now, I okay, so you can listen to the rest of that thing. Um, and how much time we got here? 44 minutes. Okay, let's listen to this one. This one's pretty fun. This one's fun because things can get out of hand and people don't even know they actually are getting out of hand just by 
how we make these systems. That's 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 the it's old about. unused code referred to as PowerPick. Functionality that Knight hadn't used in eight years. When I'm talking about software architecture and software quality and the effect of this on agility, my normal pitch is that dead code has a problem. It is the dark matter of your system. It shapes your system. Even though you can't really see it, you don't notice it, it is still there. And it has a very strong, it exerts a very strong force on your system. And the Especially in like these procedural based uh, things. I mean, I mean, in any system in general, this get, get always gets to this level. But procedural just seems to be very ripe for this problem. Problem is there is no mostly because it's really hard, really hard, really hard to test everything. And it's really hard to test everything. No code that is truly it's dead. It's all linked in. Okay. It turns out all you need to do is make a, a small assumption, a change of an assumption, and then suddenly, it's no longer dead. It's zombie code. It has come back to life, and the zombie apocalypse costs money. Now, by the way, if you're looking for a safe haven, the world is changing place. If you're looking for a safe haven, as I said, in Bristol, where I live. The um, city council actually has a zombie apocalypse plan. Okay, <laughs> you can Google it. Zombie apocalypse plan, city council, Bristol should probably get you that. Yeah, it's a two or three page description of uh, you know it's, 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 we actually have a plan, so I feel safe. Um, but not so safe against this because this is zombie code. So there's a point here. There's dead code here in the system. Now this is the interesting thing. Doug Seven then observed why code that had been dead for eight years was still present in the code base is a mystery. But that's not the point. Actually, it is because what we're dealing with here is the the eight servers that were supposed to be upgraded. There was an incorrect deployment. One of them was not upgraded. Just for those of you who are interested in this, uh, it was manually. They were manually updated. Okay, so this is yeah, this is this case. This should have been automated. But seven out of eight were updated, but not the eighth one. So it was running the old. That means that someone had to copy a file by hand to each one of these servers and make sure you got them all. Everything got the right file, the right one, and don't forget any. And do that over and over and over and over and over and every single time you change the code. Oh, well, that's not easy to screw up. <laughs> code, not the new code. Now, an important point here is that he says that that's not the point. No, it is, because when things like this happen, they don't happen because of one thing or another. They happen because of one thing and another. Right. Had it just been an incorrect deployment and there'd been no dead code to bring back to life, this problem would have that wouldn't have manifested itself. Had it been a correct deployment and the dead code had still been there, there wouldn't have been a problem. So the point is that these events occur because of a perfect storm of things. So that is part of the point. There's these subtle things. They're very difficult to recreate. It's an assumption combined with another assumption combined with another. Right. So what was the assumption? Well, I'm sure nobody's ever done this. I have. The code that was updated repurposed an old flag that was used to activate the PowerPack functionality. You recycle. Very common C++ because they're tight little, little areas and less memory access and the more data you can pack in to do, to do some sort of functionality or reuse something that's not being used. <laughs> shared. Anybody said shared mutable state? No, never, never heard of it. Like an old flag, you recycle a, uh, an old bit of memory, something to save you having to change the format of something that is established within an organization. We can't change that because that group says that we can't have more bytes in our headers and all the rest of it. So something happens like this, and that was the issue. And then at that point, boom, the first 45 minutes the market was open, handled loads of parent orders, 4 million transactions. Um, against nearly 400 million shares, and goodbye, Mike Capital. So it turns out that this little coincidence had very, very big knock-on effects. But if you want something really explosive, then one of my other favorite examples was the maiden flight of Ariane 5 in 1996, uh, 4th of June, if I remember correctly. Um, I mean, Ariane 5 is a magnificent launcher. It's a very powerful launcher for putting satellites into uh, low to high Earth orbit. Um, and its maiden flight um, looked a bit like this. One of the world's most expensive. Whoops. Fireworks. Um, that's uh, 370 million dollars. It was estimated that, and that was about 38, 39 seconds into flight. Very pretty. So 10 million dollars a second. Yeah. So you know, beat that night capital. Um, so <laughs> the point here is they scattered pieces of the cluster mission over the forests of French Guiana, which I'm pretty sure did not need that kind of uh, topping. And ultimately, it turns out, and I, I dug through this. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I actually found the original code. Is this Fortran, or what the hell is this? Look at these variable names. Look at all this stuff. The, you cannot, you are not going to tell what's going on here. What is going on here? This is crazy code. Keep going. I read about it in 1996, but I didn't find the original code until about five or six years ago. My co-author, Frank Bushman, showed me something. He said, Kevin, have you seen the code from the, you know the Ariane thing? And I said, yeah, I, I sometimes talk about it. Have you seen the code? And he showed me a little piece of code. And I said, that's not the code. And he said, how can you be sure? I said, I can read it. The guys who wrote this code, they, 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 don't, they don't read stuff like this. In fact, um, 
if you want to guess the language, there's uh, you know, some people guessing. But uh, the most perfect description came to me from uh, Linda Reising when I used this slide a couple of years back. Um, it's, it's Ada Tran. In other words, it's Ada, but spoken with a very strong Fortran accent. <laughs> yeah? Okay. And it, use, it makes no use of any of the... Uh, Just like C++ with a very strong C accent. Or Java with a very strong C++ accent. It's so funny. The facilities of Ada whatsoever. And, and what you can see is even without knowing the language, there are some things that might, if you're, if you're, if you're a software developer, there's some things that might arouse your suspicions. It's like hard-coded numbers. The same hard-coded numbers. Yeah, the hard-coded numbers. What's going on, guys? So you have some kind of 16-bit significance. And also, that's the same number in hexadecimal. So not only are they hard-coded, but the What do those mean? Programmer got so bored that they switched base just to make it more interesting. <laughs> okay. So the yeah, so this is this right here. The same checking. What we're doing here is we're thresholding. We're checking that something's not too. Right here, this thing is hexadecimal for this number here. Why? For the for the floating point values as the bit sequence. <laughs> yeah, you guys are crazy. Great. If it's too large, then we cut it at an upper limit. It's saturated arithmetic. What they're doing, just for a bit of guidance here, is v. So the, all those routines doing is clamping a value between two values. This is like one line or two lines in Kotlin. It's just clamping, so if the value goes above here, it hits here. If it goes below here, it hits here. That's all it's doing. And H, that's vertical and horizontal. And what they're doing here is they're thresholding the velocity. Now, it turns out that Ariane 4 has a very basic assumption, that it is not possible to overflow, to have integer to floating point overflow in this case. So this one is unguarded. That one is unguarded. It's not possible for Ariane 4 to exceed this. Now, if you've been paying attention, and I know it's the end of the day, you might not have been, you'll notice I'm talking about Ariane 4 now. This is reuse. This is Ariane 4 code sitting in Ariane 5. This code doesn't even have a purpose in Ariane 5. It's dead code. It doesn't even have a role. And the funniest thing is, at 40 seconds, it shuts off. But at 37 seconds, it overflows and causes a very spectacular spiral of the rocket. And at that point, a really neat piece of software kicks in. It's called the self-destruct system. That's what the self-destruct system does. You see, up until 1996, I used to think that self-destruct was a thing they did in Star Trek and other films. But actually, no, real rockets, it turns out, have a self-destruct system because it turns out they're missiles, and you really don't want those going out of control. So at least the self-destruct system works. So if you were the author of that code, well done. Nice one. <laughs> How do you know your code works? <laughs> yeah? So what we see here is there are some really interesting impacts. What we're dealing with at this point is this had profound repercussions, not simply a business, not simply some small company. It's not a ripple in the market. This actually had some major implications for Ariane Spass, uh, the owners of the cluster mission, and a lot of stuff. How easy is it to stop this stuff? How can we address this? Well, it turns out a recent paper um, makes a very, very simple point. We know we should be testing, but do we have evidence? Simple testing can prevent it's most just, critical it's, failures. It's just that st this procedure style doesn't really not lend it, and especially if you didn't do it from the very beginning, it definitely doesn't lend it uh, to it. So how much time should we have? I'll do a few minutes of this naming. You really, this, you, this is another another uh, naming video, which I, I love uh, videos about naming, especially from people who are coming from uh, ne not necessarily computer science-y uh, areas. Uh, because the naming stuff, it's it's all about the words and the language. You got to know the words and the language and what the meanings are and the synonyms and like our reverse dictionaries and all that kind of stuff. Because the, what we're doing is we're using those metaphors in the code to represent whatever domain we're, we're in. And it's important to know what the metaphors mean. And this is so, so I have a feeling that as, as, as time goes on, computer science is really not going to be computer science anymore. It's going to be more about... Uh, organizational techniques, technical organizational science, how to organize ideas and structure ideas, and look at look at these things. And a lot of it is how do we how do we what metaphors are we using? Here we go. You've been to some of my talks before. You know I talk a lot about code being good. I urge people to write code that is good. And one of the things I say is you should give things good names. And then I move on to the next slide. And this is a C conference, which I really don't like them. But I, I'll give it, I'll give them a break for this. And that is because the obvious question, what makes something a good name, does not fit on a slide. I'm not sure it fits in a talk, but I'm gonna start. Naming is subjective, and I am not gonna give you some kind of name generation engine that you can turn the handle of in your name. Please don't even think about that. Names will pop out. I'm gonna tell you what I think you should care about. So the first thing you should care about is what you name things. Like that in and of itself will improve the quality of the names if you think they matter. Because the names we give things are the only real way we have to explain what we are doing. And not just in a static artifact of the code sitting there, but about when you're trying to trace a bug and you say, it's happening somewhere in the validation routine, or do you say it's happening somewhere in V5372, right? You, you want to have words for things so that you can- The Ariane rocket stuff, it's like, 
What is this code doing? You can talk to each other. And you want to be able to tell the users, how do we format the, I don't know, hire date of the new employee? Well, you're naming that field. So it's not just in your code. It's in everything you do. He's talking about like domain driven. It's like, hey, let's have a common language so we're not switching languages and, uh, and confusing people. You know, this is what we don't do well. Yeah, yeah. S seriously. <laughs> She's even admitting it. <laughs> Consider R-A-I-I. -I. I didn't see that the first time through. It stands for Scope Bound Resource Management. Wait, we go. Where she, where she talks about RAII. Let's do it. Do well. Consider RAII. -I. Stands for Scope Bound Resource Management. You can find a thousand. Everybody's laughing. <laughs> they know. Pulls the terrible names. A class called Capital X and an instance of it called Lowercase X. All of that stuff in samples, in courses, but more sadly in production code. But you can get better. It is something you can learn to do. People are not just born good namers. Wow, that new hire. Whew, the names that come out of that person, you learn how to name well. And it starts with wanting to name well and then doing a little thinking. This and also having a good vocabulary. It's not just computers and trying to do C++. Be clear, right? I do not care what Pascal case, snake case. Yeah, that don't matter. This doesn't matter to me. Where you put your underscores. Well, this, this is bad, but everything else here is fine. I do not care about naming conventions at all. That is bike shed in my opinion, okay? Sure. This is not about... Bike shedding. If you don't know what bike shedding is, there's a term you got to look up because there's a lot of bike shedding going on in this computer software land. People trying to pad their, yeah, I know all the things and bike shedding, talking about stuff that doesn't matter, like like well, this kind of crap versus like the actual content of the name with the metaphor meaning. We're trying to put a handle on the meaning, right? What, where, the, what, what meaning are we going to use to describe this thing? Who cares what the case is? It doesn't make it. Now, languages do. I mean, certain languages that you write in, they're going to have certain ways of doing stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. Blah, blah. Should we call this class employee with a capital E or employee class or underscore employee? It's really about should it be called employee or associate or employment contract or person, okay? Uh, of course, you need tools. If you want to change your mind and Pascal case everything or snake case everything or pointy-haired boss case everything, you can go right on ahead. Uh, with a tool of some kind. Yeah, you have to use the refactoring tools. Like I like the I like the ones in JetBrains. They've they've they the ones the best ones I've seen so far. They work the best. They the, the ID really does link everything together. So if you change the name here, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna get everywhere. But it's not perfect, but it's like better than everything else. You now all we have to express ourselves is names, but we often express more than we think. Imagine your customers come to you and they say, you know that thing we already have in the system. Could be a coupon or a voucher or a certification, doesn't matter. They can end. Okay? We no longer set them up to last forever. And so you need to come up with a word for this. You're going to put this word in your code. You're going to put this word in your database. You're going to put this word in reports. That's the domain driven domain. Yeah, the same word for everything. So we have to decide what this thing is. We have to have a name. To, we have to call it something. And if you haven't given it a name yet, we're going to have to give it a name because if it's part of the, the, the critical path business process, it's got to have a name. If it's going to be in the system, it has to have a name. That's just how it works. I know people don't like to do this, but it's this is part this is a big part of the job. How many people think you can use something on its expiry date? Very few hands. Usually I get half the room. Most people don't think you can use things on their end dates, though. So these are not the same thing. Yet the world is full of programmers who arbitrarily pick things and then don't realize that they're encoding business rules into their arbitrary Something as simple as that, yes. Arbitrary choices. Sometimes you don't actually want an expiry date or an end date. You want an expiry or end date and time. And when you name it date, People think it's a date. When your code treats it like a date and time, you get some interesting conversations. Some of you know this game. It's a function called empty. Is that a verb or an adjective? It is an adjective. A lot of people think it's a verb. There's clear, right? That's your clue that it's actually an adjective. But it's not just about people reading. Right, that's adjective. subtle, right? This is subtle, right? Are you saying is empty? Or are you saying make or empty this? Clear it or is clear? Hmm. It, it really depends, and you guys better talk about it, because this kind of stuff is the kind of things that creep in and cause all kinds of issues. But it's not just about people reading your production code 20 years later. This tweet from Nicole. She's brave. Newbies are always brave when they say they can't follow things. She says, it's really hard at times. No, no, they're, they're seeing the, 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 what the issues are, yeah. It's, it's, it's appropriate. A lot of times the beginners are right. For me to follow examples with one-letter variables. I saw this tweet, and I'm like, I am with you, sister. Preach it. Then she went on, if you're trying to teach coding, maybe make it a little more descriptive or creative than just A, B, and C. At this point, I was just going to like the tweet. I've tried to do it. 
I tried in this in this, this document. Then she broke my heart. Newbies can shorten them once they feel comfortable. Oh, it killed me. Oh, right up. Oof, jab me when I heard that. Ow. Oof, no, no, we're going the wrong direction. Right? That's what we're doing. I learned this from Bjarna about 10 years ago. Whatever your heroes do, you believe you will grow up to do. And so with the person who's teaching you C++ calls all the variables A and B and all the functions F and G, you feel like you need this crutch of calling it today's date and total price. But when you're a big girl, you'll be able to get in single letter names like, like your hero. So everywhere, your production code, but your samples, your slideware, the things where names supposedly don't matter, they matter. They do matter. I've told you many times, when you give things a good name, they tell a story. First, we will open the file, read the prices, update the orders, everybody's happy. What I don't always point out is that names can lie. They can tell the wrong story. Imagine a class called application has a member variable called status, which is up from some new application status, and we have the set function. Of course, this is the code for set status, right? You all knew that. I could have hidden the line of code, you could have written the line of code. Of course, we're just gonna take what we passed and stick it into status. That's what set status does. Until one day, we need something else. Some kind of logging, auditing, caching thing. And we go into all of our set functions, right? And we do our little weird thing. And it's fine, spiritually, this function is still set status, life is good. No one's gonna be confused if they call it. Stuff keeps going on, and it turns into this. Now, if you're setting it to approved, I don't know, maybe we send them an email, congratulations, your application's been approved. If you're setting it to denied, send them a different email. Ooh, see, it starts so innocent. It starts so innocently. Now, the calling code is telling a very simple story. I'm just gonna set the status, I'm just gonna set that a new value. But that's not really the story, right? There's a ton of stuff happening when it's approved and when it's denied. And it's hidden in this sort of, not exactly lie, but this confusing, oh, we're just gonna set the status to approved. Plus also, let's just say that. Set the status to approved. How much longer is that then? Approve. Why are we talking in, in long, obfuscated sentences? So we can just have an approve function and a deny function. There we go. This is such a subtle difference, but in the reading and the writing of the code, and well, the reading of it, it becomes so much clearer like what is exactly going on here. It's very subtle, but this this thing is the is it goes from like you getting asked a thousand questions about your about your code, people being people being confused to like, oh, this is readable like prose. I'm reading this like a book. Oh, I see what's going on here. I don't have to ask anybody. I can just look at it. Yeah, we're repeating ourselves a little bit because we set the status variable in both cases. But the good stuff, the dot dot dots that I can't fit on the slide, that's there for us. Okay, so I'm gonna let you listen to the rest of her talk. I might do another of a video on hers because it's actually pretty good. And there are some things I disagree with. Um, da, 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 the error of our ways. Boo, boo, boo. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. So that's about it for this one. It's pretty long, about an hour. Hey, thanks for hanging out and uh, watching this this design stuff. Because um, yeah, unfortunately, at this level with the boop stuff, this is you have to kind of twist your brain around this kind of thing because we're trying to move move above it so we can make our lives easier and our teammates' lives easier. That's...